Hello class, uh, guess what time it is? It's time for module eight. So without further ado, we'll get started with module eight objectives one and two. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, module eight is about the family system. We're going to talk about family systems theory, and we're also going to talk about uh, approaches to therapy using family systems. Okay, here are our objectives. We'll discuss the principles of family systems. We'll do that today and also explain historical family disease models. And then for next time on the next video, we'll compare and contrast modern family treatment models and then outline the purpose structure and strategies of some of the evidence-based approaches, specific evidence-based approaches. Okay, so objective number one, we're gonna discuss the principles of family systems. First thing is, what's a family? Well, a family can be parents, children, extended family, but I don't want you to think too rigidly about what a family is because these are not necessarily blood relations, though they very often are. Um, and these are not necessarily people who live together either. So these are people who you're involved with at, in a family kind of capacity, but again, they don't have to be blood relations. So I want you to think about who your family actually is. Uh, so the family systems approach um, treats the family as this kind of interconnected system, this complex emotional system that sometimes supports problem behaviors. And so we're gonna talk about that. One of the basic assumptions is that there's an interdependence among family members. So that one family member causes changes in the behaviors of others, and that happens reciprocally. It's back and forth. So every family member basically influences the behavior of every other member. So when you have a member of the family who has a problem like substance use, they are influencing other members of their family, but other members of the family are also influencing them. So the idea behind uh, family systems theory or the family systems approach is that uh, families try to progress toward equilibrium or a homeostasis or a sort of um, place in which there is not conflict. And so sometimes uh, behaviors of a single person, for example, like substance use, might disrupt that homeostasis, might kind of throw things off, um, but the family is always going to try to move back toward a kind of um, stability or homeostasis. We can also call that an equilibrium. Okay, so as I was mentioning, addiction affects family members and it can throw off that equilibrium. If someone starts using drugs, for example, that's going to affect the family and it's going to throw off that equilibrium. So all of a sudden there's sort of an imbalance going on. But a lot of times, I don't want you to think that, you know, the family is, is all of a sudden disrupted forever. What will happen is a new equilibrium will form around the drug addiction. And there we see problems because the family members start behaving in ways in which we can kind of get a new stability forming around that problem behavior, drug addiction, and sometimes that can serve to maintain the addiction. Uh, so addiction and the family behaviors that support addiction are treated as non-pathological. And I think you'll see that some of the ways that families uh, relate to addiction and the way that the person with substance use disorder works in a family it are, are, are ways that kind of make sense, you know, given the issues. Um, but what happens is that then families kind of get locked into negative and repetitive behavior patterns that, that will support the addiction. So once the family finds that new equilibrium uh, that, that um, includes the addiction, a lot of times it's a kind of locked in thing that it's hard to get out of because it, once again, we're always moving toward that equilibrium. So once we're there, we're good, we're stable, a-okay. Um, unfortunately, at oftentimes it will involve an addiction. Okay, so I want you to um, use this analogy to think about 
uh, family systems approach. So if you think about this, this mobile in the picture, um, the movement of one person, if I were to pull on, for example, the uh, dark purple guy, that is going to affect all the other family members, right? It's gonna affect that dark green guy the most, but it's gonna start moving all the other family members. And so a change in any one person tends to affect the whole family. And that little pink thing at the top is sort of this or organizing, we can call it a fulcrum. It sort of is the organizing force behind the whole family. And sometimes that could be religion. Sometimes it can be a single family member. Um, like let's say your mom who sort of holds it all together sort of thing, uh, or your father that does so. But it could also be a mental illness or an addiction that causes that that has a sort of um, overarching uh, kind of cause of this equilibrium. Okay, so what happens with addiction in the family? Addiction will impact all or many of the members in the family, um, and again, it's not just the biological members of the family. The so family systems theory thinks about uh, thinks about family changes as being multi generational. So let me explain this. How does it go on through generations and generations and generations? Let's say that my mother is um, addicted to alcohol. She's got alcohol use disorder. In the event that she has alcohol use disorder. I might start to treat her differently as her daughter. For example, I might start to sort of baby her, watch out for her, do things for her and stuff like that because I think she needs help and she does need help. Um, and I start acting, let's say, like a parent to my mother. Now, my children are going to see that as normal behavior between a mother and a daughter. And th my children then might start treating me the same way I treat my mother. And so these effects comes, kind of go down in families um, uh, among generations. Now, I want you to remember that addiction does not necessarily tear apart a family. It can be destabilizing, but the family is always going to move towards stabilization, toward homeostasis, toward equilibrium. So addiction can become kind of entrenched in a family system. Okay, well, I wanna talk a little bit about the genetics and environmental influences because we know genetics come from those biological family members. So genetic influences, let's talk about those first. They account, studies show that they account for about 40 to 60% of the etiology or the cause of substance use disorder. Now that's a lot, right? And so we've talked about this before, that biological predisposition. Um, when, when your risk for substance use disorder will increase with biological parents who've had substance use disorder. If you have one biological parent, you have some risk. If you have two biological parents with substance use disorder, you have a much greater risk. And so again, that's a genetic predisposition. But I want to be clear on the genetic predisposition. Most children with a biological parent who has substance use disorder won't get substance use disorder. So biology is not destiny here. You have to have, you have the predisposition, but then you've got to have these environmental influences as well. So the environmental influences come from inside the family and also from outside the family. So you'll have intrafamilial intra influences, intra meaning inside, in, in the family. And those will be things like parenting practices, parental discipline, uh, whether the parents are, are monitoring the kids and things like that, um, cohesion of the family, parent drug use, uh, things like that within that immediate family. And then there's this extra familial influences, for example, the friends of the parents and the schools and the juvenile justice system. So there are influences that go beyond the family as well that are seen as important in this family systems uh, idea. Okay, I want to talk about a couple of things 
that are important environmental influences. One is adverse childhood experiences. Those are called ACEs. And there were, uh, there were some studies that were done that looked at a certain uh, list, I'm gonna show you some on the next slide, of uh, different kinds of traumas, basically, that kids experience prior to the age of 18. And what we see is that a, a greater number of these is associated with an increased risk for a substance use disorder in adulthood, the more of these that you have. And I encourage you to get online and do an ACE test and find out how many of these you have. So four or more starts to get into some risk uh, factors for uh, substance use disorder. Now, again, doesn't mean you're gonna get it. You gotta have the genetic predisposition as well. Um, another issue is caregiver substance use and child maltreatment. So some caregivers uh, or parents who are uh, parents or other caregivers who are uh, using substances will maltreat, will mistreat children. That doesn't mean that they all do. There are plenty of caregivers who use substances that do not mistreat children. Um, but what we do see is that caregiver use uh, is associated with child maltreatment, so child abuse and neglect, and is also associated with children going into foster care. So those are two really important environmental influences. Okay, as I was talking about, adverse childhood experiences are varied, but there are lots of kinds of things, um, physical, uh, uh, emotional, and sexual abuse, neglect, physical and, and emotional neglect. And then there's all kinds of household dysfunctions. For example, mental illness, let's say of a parent, uh, mother treated violently, divorce happening in a family uh, with the, the parents. And again, these are things that happen to you prior to the age of 18, an incarcerated relative, uh, substance uh, use in the family. Okay, uh, the next objective is to explain the historical family disease models. Now, these family disease models are a little bit outdated, but uh, we're covering them for a historical reason because many people um, still basically believe in them or use them. Um, but again, they're outdated and, and I'll talk to you about why that is. It's because they're not supported by research. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about three models of family systems. And the first one I'll talk about today is the family disease model. And as I said, that has less empirical support, less research support. That one was developed from addiction treatment. And so practitioners, addiction treatment press practitioners uh, looked at families and this is what they saw. Um, the family systems models and the behavioral models I'll talk about next time, those both have quite a bit more uh, support and the two of them together are going to be combined to make up a lot of the treatments that we talk about in the end. They generally draw from two and three, most of the treatments that are out there now. So again, we're gonna talk just about these historical models now, the family disease models. So the dis family disease model, you probably heard about in some way, shape, or form, most of us have. It developed out of substance uh, treatment settings. It started in the 1950s. Um, by the 1980s, it was really well entrenched. And the idea was that addiction is a disease of the family that caused the family to behave in certain ways. And at that time, uh, uh, Al-Anon started, and that was the basically the branch of Alcoholics Anonymous that would treat families and relatives. Um, the studies that were done on this were generally focused on white middle class families with a father that had alcohol use disorder, so they were somewhat limited. And that you know now we find that the support is uh, pretty pretty minimal. Okay, so in practice, what this meant, and this is where you've heard of it, is that there was codependency in the family. And the codependency was basically one person was addicted to a substance, and then other people became codependent. And there's one person particularly who is seen as the chief codependent or the chief enabler. And that person, it basically uh, allows the addiction to happen by supporting it. 
in one way or another. So maybe, um, I know I'm just going to use this traditional example because that's what a lot of this is based on. So dad is has alcohol problems, drinks a lot. And mom is very careful to take care of dad, to, to keep the kids away from him when he's drinking and he's upset, to clean up after him, to make sure she calls in to work for him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that those kinds of behaviors were seen as enabling. Um, and then this mother who's doing all this or wife who's doing all this is now also neglecting all her own needs because she's always in this caretaking role for her husband with alcohol use disorder. There were also all of these other uh, children that were labeled under this family disease model. So you had the lost child, um, the problem child, the mascot and then the family hero. And you can kind of look at some of the, the I'm not gonna to dwell too much on these because you know, once again, it doesn't have a lot of empirical support, but I, I wanted to tell you that the ha family hero is like usually the oldest child because there's also some age related or uh, child uh, position related stuff in this idea. And the family hero was the oldest child and they were the high achiever following the rules, seeking approval, very responsible, um, was kind of taking on almost a, a parental role. Okay, well, you know, so these roles, the chemically dependent person, this is the, the person who's addicted, the family enabler, the chief enabler is the main codependent, the family hero, the scapegoat, lost child mascot. These roles came out of clinical practice. So these were families that were being seen in clinician's office. They had not been empirically validated. And when they when the studies out there were really out, they're trying to empirically validate them, they ran into problems. So they just don't neatly apply. On top of that, it's kind of blamey. You know, it sort of said that like, oh, well, actually the wife is the problem, which uh, roll our eyes collectively on that one, right? Um, it's had so, a kind of patriarchal, um, kind of blamey system going on there. Anyway, so we have now got a couple of better models and we'll talk about those family systems model and behavioral model next time. You guys have a great day.